Every state has its urban legends, and Indiana is no different. With a lot of royal areas, there are plenty of creepy stories about old buildings, deserted back roads, and remote cemeteries. Have you ever heard the tourism commercial for the Hoosier State? There is more than corn in Indiana. That line is definitely true, and today we will look at 10 of the many urban legends that let you know Indiana just may have more than corn. In Brazil, Indiana, there is a cemetery that is said to predict your death. Legends say to see the vision, you must walk up the steps on a dark night, counting as you go. When you reach the top, the spirit of the first caretaker will be waiting. After he shows you the vision of your death, you are supposed to walk back down the steps, counting each one. When you reach the bottom, if you counted the same number of steps as when you went up, the vision will not come true. However, if you didn't count the same number of steps, the vision of your death will come to pass. Don't try and cheat the count by walking on the grass either. If you do, a phantom hand will push you down the hill. There will also be a deep red mark from the hand that will stay with you for several days. It is the mark of the devil. William Colbertstone was considered the richest man in Indiana in the mid-19th century. Despite his wealth, life wasn't easy for him. His first wife, Eliza, died of typhoid pneumonia in 1865, leaving behind five children for William to care for alone. Two years later, he remarried Cornelia Warner Eggleston, a local widow. It was then William bought the mansion as a wedding present for his new bride. Finally, life seemed to be getting back to normal until a few months later, William's 21-year-old daughter died from a heart attack. William and Cornelia had two children of their own. In 1880, Cornelia passed away in her bedroom. About four years later, William married again for the third time, but he died in 1892. According to reports, the Copleston children were held to very high standards by their father. When they did get in trouble, they were locked in a large closet on the third floor called the punishment room for hours. Perhaps the most well-known daughter of William and Cornelia is Blanche. She was well known in New Albany for her love life. Before her father passed away, Blanche fell in love with a circus performer, but her father strictly forbid her from marrying the man of lower class. He was so against it that he even put it in his will that she would not receive her inheritance within 10 years of his passing. Blanche ran off and married her lover anyway, and then contested the will, winning the case. The Culverston family sold the house in 1899. Through the years, it has changed ownership several times, each leaving its own mark on the mansion. In 1976, the state of Indiana took ownership and it has been restored to its former glory and is in a museum today. It is believed that Cornelia Culverston walks the halls of the mansion, making sure it's kept up to her standards. Employees and visitors have reported seeing a woman in period clothing on the second and fourth floor, hearing footsteps from above while on the ground floor, and doors opening and closing on their own. Not all of the activity is contributed to Cornelia. Some people have reported smelling cigar smoke and hearing a man's voice on the third floor when no one is around. The carriage house is also rumored to be haunted. In 1888, it was struck by lightning and burnt to the ground, killing several servants. The building was rebuilt and turned into a rental property. Tenants have reported hearing strange, unexplainable sounds and seeing shadow people move around the building. On Cedar Canyon Road, 
there is the ruins of an old chimney stack known as Devil's Hollow, and according to legends, is where the house of a witch once stood. There are two versions to the legend. The first says that because of the secluded area where her house was, the local satanic cults and witch covens would come here for their meetings and sacrificial rituals. The old woman who lived in the house also participated in these rituals. The people of Fort Wayne considered themselves a good Christian community and wanted to put a stop to the rituals once and for all. One day, they decided to head up the hill to the old woman's house. When they arrived, they set fire to it with the woman inside. The second version is that a sweet old woman lived in the house and would often be bothered by local teens. When she would report the harassment to the authorities, nothing would be done to stop it. After talking to her friends, they all decided that if rumor spread she was a witch, they would surely leave her alone. The strategy didn't work, and one night, a group of teens went to her house and set it on fire with the old woman inside. According to both legends, if you go to the spot where the old chimney is, the old woman's presence is still felt. If you go on a full moon, the feelings are even stronger. Some have claimed the old woman will appear and chase people off her land. Legends also say that police have call, been called out to the site many times over the years because of the reports of cults performing their rituals. Constructed in 1899, Whispering Estates was home to Dr. John Gibbons and his wife, Jessie. They were a loving couple who adored children and even adopted three orphans. Despite their good intentions, they suffered many tragedies while living here. The first tragedy reported was when their 10-year-old adopted daughter, Rachel, started a fire in the front parlor. She suffered extremely bad burns and was placed in a bedroom on the top floor where she died 48 hours later. Not long after her death, strange things started happening and continue to be reported today. People have reported seeing and hearing a little girl about the same age as Rachel around the estate. Rachel is not the only child reported to haunt the home. A 10-month-old adopted infant named Elizabeth is reported to have died in the master bedroom not long after Rachel. People who go into that room report smelling baby powder and hearing the cries of a baby when there are no babies there. Dr. and Mrs. Gibbons took the death of two of their children hard, but it seems it was the hardest on Mrs. Gibbons. She developed a severe case of pneumonia shortly after Elizabeth's death. Just two short weeks later, she passed away from complications in the same room as Elizabeth. People have reported hearing the sounds of breathing difficulties and coughing from the master bedroom. Others have reported a strong pressure on their chest. Other reports say that the door handles move on their own and the closet door will open unexpectedly by itself. Other tragedies that have been reported at Whispering Estates through the years include a young boy that fell down the stairs and died from his injuries and an older man in one of the bathrooms on the top floor died from natural causes. In 2006, the home was bought and turned into a bed and breakfast. It was then the reports of paranormal activity seemed to increase. On top of the other reports, people started claiming they hear whispers from all directions of the home that seemed to have no source. It was then the building was named Whispering Estates. Today, it is no longer a bed and breakfast, but reservations can be made for those wishing to visit. Columbia City Jail, originally named Whitley Jail, dates back to 1875 and it has served as both the local jail and the sheriff's residence. It also served as the courthouse for a time until a new one was built. 
After the closing, the building was home to the county offices until the repairs became too costly. By 1985, the building was no longer in use, and in 1991, a local car dealer bought the old building. But instead of restoring it, he uses it for a haunted attraction once a year. The old Whitley Jail has always been reported to be haunted and is considered one of the most haunted places in Indiana. The most famous spirit of the jail is said to be Charles Butler, a former inmate. Before prison, Charles was married to a woman named Abby. Together, they had one child. He was known to love getting drunk and bullying anyone he could. He is also said to have had a terrible temper, and anyone in his way would suffer his wrath. Unfortunately, the ones to suffer the most from his abuse was his wife and child. In 1883, Charles shot his wife in the back while she was trying to protect their son from his abuse. Charles landed himself in Whitley County Jail for the murder. Not long after arriving, Charles and five other inmates escaped when the sheriff, Frank Alwyn, was away. Eventually, he was recaptured and finally tried for murder. He was found guilty and sentenced to hang. The hanging of Charles Butler did not go as planned. After being attached to the gallows, the trap door was open, but Butler didn't fall instantly and break his neck like most do. It is said that he hung there for 10 minutes before he strangled to death. When the authorities cut him down three minutes later, he was still alive, but later died inside the jail. People who have visited Whitley Jail say the they can feel the presence of many spirits. It is believed that the prisoners who died at the gallows are still suffering and refuse to leave. Other reports say you can feel an intense electrical presence upon entering the building. People have also reported that cameras malfunction and fully charged batteries quickly die. Some have claimed to see the apparition of Charles Butler standing outside the old jail many times. Along with Charles, it is believed that Sheriff Alwyn still remains in the jail. There have been reports of ghostly figures seen moving from the jail section to the sheriff's quarters. Other reports include the feelings of being watched, sounds of footsteps approaching, then passing, doors opening and closing on their own, disembodied laughter, knocking, and curtains moving without wind. Some people have also reported being grabbed while in the cells alone. Travis Scales was a wealthy doctor and a bank president who built the Scales Lake area. He had many servants that worked for him, but the most well-known is said to be the housekeeper, Annie. Sometime in the late 1920s, the Scales family went out for the night. While the family was gone, the mansion caught fire and burnt to its foundation. Annie's body was never recovered. The remains of those who perished in the blaze are said to be buried at Pleasant Hill Cemetery. Legends say that Annie's body was never found because she had been murdered and the fire set to cover the crime. It is also believed that Annie didn't get a proper burial and that she continues to haunt the area. According to legends, at night around the lake, weeping and crying can still be heard as well as strange, unexplainable voices. Strange lights over the lake have also been reported as well as dark, shadowy figures. Along Old Tennyson Road, there have been reports of people seeing a woman dressed in black roaming the road. Some have even claimed the woman in black jumped on their car, causing them to run off the road. It is also reported that Black Andy wanders Pleasant Hill Cemetery. Indiana State Hospital is the oldest hospital and perhaps the most haunted place in Indiana. Completed in 1848, 
The building was originally called Central Indiana Hospital for the Insane until 1926 when the name was changed. The hospital treated all kinds of mentally disturbed patients, from people suffering from general insanity to the criminally insane. The hospital was overcrowded most of the time, with as many as 3,000 patients at its peak. With the overcrowding, soon, stories of abusive treatments and poor living conditions began. Even after the stories of patients being chained to walls in a dark basement, the hospital remained open until 1994, and it is now vacant of the living. Former employees and visitors to the property report seeing apparitions of the former patients all around the facility. The apparitions have been reported to be seen running down the hallways and even outside wearing patient gowns and robes. Other reports include seeing faces of people through the various windows of the property, phantom footsteps, screams heard from the basements, and electronic devices turning on and off by themselves. The town of Story, Indiana was founded in 1851 as a longing town. In its heyday, it was the largest settlement in the area with two general stores, a schoolhouse, a slaughterhouse, a sawmill, a post office, a blacksmith, and a church. During the Great Depression, things went downhill and the people of Story left the town in search of better opportunities. The town remained abandoned until two hippies from Bloomington bought and reassembled the town. Rick Hofsetter is the current owner of Story. Today, Story Inn has 18 rooms and cottages. Each has its own unique history and no rooms are alike. None of the rooms are identified by numbers like most hotels, but by name and none of the rooms have modern inventions like clocks, TVs, and radios. A tradition at Story Inn are the guest books in each room where guests can document their experiences, including the paranormal activity they have experienced. The most common report is of the Blue Lady. Guests and staff believe she is the wife of Dr. George Story, the founder of the small town. The room where the Blue Lady most often appears was called the Garden Room, but since then renamed after its most frequent visitor. People believe that if a blue light is turned on in the room, she will appear, but she has also been known to appear without the light. She has been described as having blue eyes and leaving items that are blue in color behind. Some have reported smelling cherry tobacco which is said to have been the Blue Lady's favorite while she was alive. The Willard Library was founded in 1885 by William Carpenter. When he passed away, he left all of his estate to his businesses and the library instead of his surviving daughter, Louise Carpenter. Louise sued the library board for what she believed was hers, claiming her father was not in a sound state of mind when he wrote his last will. Louise lost the case. Many people believe her spirit is still haunting the library until she gets what she's owed. The first sighting of the Grey Lady was reported by a custodian in 1937. He came to the library in the middle of the night to stoke the fire in the furnace. The custodian put his light down for just a moment, and when he picked it back up, he saw a woman standing in front of him. The custodian reported she was wearing a long gray dress with a veil over her face. Knowing there shouldn't have been anyone else in the building at that time, he said something to her, and she disappeared around the corner. There are a few hot spots in the library where the gray lady is often seen or felt. She has been seen upstairs in the local history department, as well as the children's department and hallways. The children's department is considered to be the most haunted, especially the Story Pit area. 
Some of the unexplainable occurrences reported besides her apparition is the smell of perfume, unexplainable cold spots, strange noises, books and furniture moving around, odd items found in the library, and the water turning on and off by itself. In Henryville, Indiana, sometime in the early 1900s, there was a terrible car accident along Blue Lick Road, not far from Mount Zion Cemetery. The accident claimed the life of a young woman who was buried in the cemetery. According to legends, the woman roams the cemetery and appears to have a strange green glow around her. Legends also say if you park at the cemetery at night, she will jump on your car looking for a ride home. When she disappears, she will leave behind a green goo-like substance where she jumped. It will remain on your car until it is washed off. In 